Now more than ever, innovative technologies are fueling change and sparking new ways of thinking. Collaboration between corporations and startups is key to staying at the forefront of these trends. However, finding the right startups can be expensive, time-consuming, and ineffective. But Plug and Play is here to help. As a corporate partner, you will gain access to a whole ecosystem of innovation. Discover startups that meet your tech interests. Stay updated on the latest trends and network with industry peers. We will help you during every stage of your innovation journey, no matter where you are and where you want to go. Get in touch today. Hello everyone and welcome to our today's workshop, the German Supply Chain Act, or in German you would say Lieferkettengesetz, with Taylor Wessing and Prewave. My name is Monika Brauers, I'm Senior Program Manager in Hamburg, where we are leading our activities in the field of supply chain and logistics in Europe, and also diving into topics like new energy and hydrogen. That's why we are also about to start the first batch of our new program, the H2 Startup Accelerator. I will be your host today, and I have the pleasure to give you a first little introduction into the plug and play and the speakers we have today. I hope you are going to enjoy the session, and I wanted to thank everyone for taking the time and joining us, especially, of course, a big thank you to our presenters, Taylor Wessing and Prewave. For those who would like to get to know a little bit more about plug and play and who haven't heard that much of us, we are a global innovation platform with our headquarter in Silicon Valley and our business is based on three pillars. We are one of the most active investors in the world. That means that we invest in over 250 companies a year in which some of them have been very successful. Our most successful investment was, for example, N26, that some of you know very well, I think, and other companies like Rappi, Honey, Landing Club, and many more. Not only investment is one of our expertises, but also in the past years, we have developed two more pillars. One pillar is the pillar of acceleration, where we help startups to grow with mentoring, workshops, connecting them to VC and corporate network. That leads us to our third pillar, which is corporate innovation. We work closely together with, co with corporations as the extended arm of the innovation unit. We help them to find the right startups for their challenges and use cases. And we help them along their innovation roadmap and strategy. We connect the corporates not only with the startups, but also connect them to a variety of our 500 different partners from over 19 industries you can see here on this chart. Last year, for example, we kicked off our new maritime vertical in Antwerp, which is really closely connected to Hamburg and the supply chain and logistics vertical. We are also covering more verticals like mobility, where we have an office in Stuttgart, there we work together with Daimler, Porsche, Bosch, and many other OEMs and suppliers. But we are running also verticals like health, internet, and many, many more. During, during the past years, we have grown a lot. We have over 40 locations worldwide where we help local cooperation with international startups and an international ecosystem where we bring them all together and faster the process of innovation. Our ecosystem includes governments, startups, VCs, mentors, corporations, and many, many more. If you would like to find out more, please get in touch with us. We can jump on a call, we can have a coffee, uh, and we are happy to explain you more. Now, before we continue and uh, get started with the workshop, let's go to our housekeeping rules. There's not much to know, just one thing. You are able to ask questions at the end. Please don't be shy and use the Q&A button you will find at the lower third of your, of your screen. And our team is going to process all of the inbound questions then. 
and we try to get as many as possible towards our panelists. Now I would like to hand it over to our co-hosts. Welcome on stage, Sebastian Rüns, who is a salary partner at Taylor Wessing. For the ones who don't know Taylor Wessing, it's a global law firm, uh, and they are mentoring in many, many plug and play offices. Sebastian is a specialist for the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, and that's why he is here and all of us are here. Together discussing with Sebastian, we have Harald Nietzschinger, who is CEO and co-founder of Prewave. Maybe some of you might know Prewave because they were part of our previous batch. They, extend, they attended our expo in November. And uh, yes, Prewave, uh, what does Prewave make? Prewave makes supply chains more resilient by mentor, monitoring and predicting supply chain risks through AI technology. I would say Sebastian and Harald, I stop screen sharing. And with that, the stage is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian Rünz from Taylor Wessing. I'm here today with my uh, colleague um, um, Harald Nitschiga from uh, Prewave. And we would like to talk about the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act, or in short, the um, Supply Chain Act. Um, let's take a look at our agenda first. So first, we would like to give you a short overview on what the Supply Chain Act is actually about. Um, then we would like to focus on um, one of the most important obligations under the Supply Chain Act and how it can be accomplished, the risk analysis, um, um, according to Section 5 of the um, Supply Chain Act. And then, um, as Monica already mentioned, we still have time for your uh, questions and answers. Perfect. I would suggest, Harald, uh, do you have anything to add or should we just start right away with our first slide? I have nothing to add, just a short welcome from my side. And Sebastian, uh, let's, let's dive in. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so here on the first slide, um, you have a short overview on the content of the uh, German Supply Chain Act. Um, and also um, compared to the French uh, Loi de Vigilance and um, just recently the first draft of the EU Commission on a um, European um, Supply Chain Act. So the first comprehensive um, supply chain law entered into force in France in 2017. However, this um, law did not really describe what companies have to do with respect to human rights due diligence. The German law is much more detailed on the um, due diligence process. Um, and as you probably know, it becomes effective in 2023 for companies with at least 3,000 employees and in 2024 for companies with at least 1,000 employees. It contains penalties up to 2% of the um, annual group turnover in case of violations um, of due diligence obligations. And since the end of February, we um, have a draft of the EU Commission for European Supply Chain Regulation, which um, goes far beyond um, the um, German law. For example, it uh, does not only contain um, direct suppliers, but also indirect um, suppliers. It includes more environment-related obligations. Um, the, it's also applicable for smaller companies and so on. So uh, when you compare the two laws, you can see that the um, European draft, at least the draft, it's, uh, it's not um, decided, not enforced yet, um, um, goes beyond the German law. So this just as a short overview on the, um, on the, on the um, three different laws here. Uh, maybe, maybe Sebastian, if I can jump in here with one of the sure. main questions uh, we always face uh, when presenting the supply chain law to our customers, and that is around the applicability of the law. Um, so, uh, okay, it's clear that uh, a German company with more than 3,000, more than 1,000 employees is covered. But what if you take the situation of a, let's say, a United States-based holding company? Let's take General Electric as an example. Uh, a General Electric a subsidiary in Germany uh, with more than 1,000 employees. Is that also covered under the law and, and to what extent? 
It's a good question. It was uh, uh, complicated in the beginning because the law is not 100% clear on that point. Um, in the meanwhile, um, the authorities um, gave a statement on um, the applicability applicability um, uh, with respect to um, foreign um, um, with respect to foreign parent companies so when we just have a um, German parent company then all the um, employees located in Germany have to be counted together um, and then this uh, number that is counted together has to reach the thresholds of 3,000 or 1,000 if the parent company on the other side is abroad and only um, companies below the parent company um, are in Germany, then you have to um, look at each um, German company individually. Each in the, uh, German company has to reach the thresholds of the law itself so that the uh, law is applicable. Um, so you don't have to count together the German, your example with General Electric's, the US employees and the German employees. So you just have to take a look at the German employees of the single German um, entities. Mm -hmm. and, and what about, for instance, a Chinese subsidiary of Siemens, yeah, so a German parent company, but let's say they are foreign subsidiaries. In, to which extent are they covered by the law? They are covered, but uh, on a different level. So uh, right now uh, we're talking about the um, scope and how many employees have to be counted. There, the, uh, the law is pretty clear. It's only the employees in Germany. So um, your example with Siemens would mean that uh, it's basically only the employees in, um, of Siemens in Germany that have to be counted. However, um, if the German companies have subsidiaries in other countries, that, and they fall in the scope of the law because in Germany there are enough employees, then the, the German companies may be obliged um, to, um, to already uh, to, to also um, perform due diligence um, obligations for their companies abroad. So this means that a German company um, um, has to um, look and has to go into more detail on what is happening at their um, foreign subsidiary. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> okay, perfect. This um, on this slide. So, uh, which human rights are basically um, covered by the Supply Chain Act? Here you can see the most important ones uh, mentioned on this slide. Um, these are basically the ones you would expect to be covered by um, a su um, supply chain law. Um, besides, there are some others, um, uh, just uh, to, to, to give you a notion what else is covered, uh, de deprivation of land, harmful changes to uh, soil, water, air pollution, also some environment related um, obligations, but just a few, for example, with respect uh, to products containing mercury, or uh, persistent organic pollutants um, and hazardous waste. Mm -hmm. So which due diligence obligations are required from companies? We try to divide these obligations in um, different levels, um, whether they are less or more complex obligations. So on the bottom, the first three, uh, you find assignment of responsibilities or drafting a policy statements. These obligations are uh, can be considered um, to be easier, not that complex. Then when you go up, you find number four, five, and six, it becomes more complex with um, the implement implementation of a complaints procedure uh, or your the uh, public reporting obligation. And then on the top, you find the most complex obligations um, which are carrying out a risk analysis and then um, based on the findings of this risk analysis to take appropriate preventive and um, remedial measures. Uh, maybe one question, Sebastian, that also mm -hmm. always comes up is um, the extent to which the indirect supplier, so the tier two is covered and to which extent the due diligence obligations apply to, to those indirect suppliers? So indirect suppliers are only covered if a company has substantial knowledge that um, violations um, 
are, appear to um, be possible at indirect suppliers. It's the the expression is also not 100% clear and uh, raises a couple of questions, of course. But um, the, the most important point to mention uh, first is that um, in a first step, only your own business area and direct suppliers are covered and indirect suppliers only if you have um, certain indications um, that uh, human rights violations appear to be possible at an indirect supplier. So how can you uh, receive that information? One option would be you already have this information in your company because something happened in the past and you already know about um, indirect suppliers uh, where uh, violations took place, or you um, receive this information from the outside. For example, from an NGO that informs you with a very detailed um, report on a certain um, um, region where violations take place and wh uh, where your um, supplier is um, located or, um, for example, um, information provided by um, officials. From our perspective, there is no obligation to investigate um, at an indirect supplier level whether there are risks. Um, so you, so the, the wording, um, the wording suggests that it's not a proactive approach but more a reactive approach, depending on whether you already have information or whether you receive information. And this is, I think, really one of the key points of difference towards the uh, European, uh, right. European Union level draft, uh, which uh, came uh, was presented by the commission, I think two weeks ago, where the whole value chain is, is covered by the due diligence obligations. So not just the suppliers uh, to the, let's say indirect suppliers, but even the customer side is covered, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. It, it, it goes far beyond the, 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 the German approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, okay, here we uh, try to provide you with a, um, um, with a suggestion for a timeline. Um, just for you, important to know, this is just this is an ideal process. As you can see, most of the obligations uh, we are showing on this slide are already uh, covered in 2022. However, right now, again, the authorities made clear that there's also time in 2023 to fulfill the obligations mentioned in the Supply Chain Act. Um, so when your business year matches your calendar year, uh, matches the your business year uh, matches the calendar year, um, and you reach the th threshold of at least three thousand employees, meaning that the law is applicable to you in twenty twenty three. Then you would need to uh, publish your first uh, report in twenty twenty four, and describe the situation uh, of twenty twenty three. However, since this uh, whole process is a very complex project, uh, process and uh, yeah, basically a change process uh, that covers so many different uh, departments at a, a company. Um, most companies we are working together with already started, of course, to, um, to perform um, uh, a variety of obligations already in 2022 so that they still have enough time in uh, 2023 to finalize the whole process. Mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> and yeah, I think now in the second part of, of this presentation, um, we now want to take a deep dive on the one particular due diligence obligation that um, Sebastian just showed is the one which you should be getting started with uh, as one of the, the earliest. And it's also the one with the highest complexity. And that is the, the, the obligation to conduct a risk analysis for all direct suppliers, also for the own business operations. But in particular, the complexity is also around doing this for all direct suppliers. And here we would like to now introduce a step-by-step -step approach that is both lawful, but also, and um, uh, I think that is then my side of the, the presentation efficient. Uh, 
And of course, Sebastian will, will make sure to, that it's also lawful. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the approach that we, we present and, and um, uh, recommend is a, a risk-based approach. And that is very much in line with, with what uh, the law uh, requires. So um, the law requires uh, a company that falls under the uh, supply chain law to conduct uh, at least once per year a, a risk analysis which as its outcome has a, a prioritization of uh, risks in the supply chain. And based on that prioritization, um, companies are obligated to take adequate measures. And within this funnel chart here, this is also uh, the two, let's say, sides um, we are looking at. On the left-hand side here, it's the risk analysis. And on the right-hand side here, it's the prevention and remedial measures that are then taken as a result of the risk analysis. The prevention and remedial measures are, of course, potentially resource intensive. Yeah, they, can, they can range from doing simple uh, su supplier questionnaires, asking suppliers for statements, um, doing workshops, but going then to very resource and cost intensive measures like on-site audits and potentially um, even though there's no hard requirement in the law, but an offboarding of a supplier if there's repeated issues at the supplier. So let's look at the first, on the left-hand side here, the risk analysis and the approaches uh, that can be taken. Um, we want to get to the prioritization of suppliers, uh, a risk-based prioritization uh, based on which we want to take the measures. But as a first step, we want to um, reduce the numbers of suppliers we um, uh, sort of uh, look in, in, in depth and check in depth um, by excluding what we call non-substantial suppliers. And uh, how can that be done? Um, there is uh, basically a, 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 a three-step approach. Um, as a first step, uh, we consider all direct suppliers as they are available in a, a supplier database, such an SAP system or equivalent. That is then uh, considered as the basis. There's um, no differentiation between, let's say, direct or indirect spend, production material or non-production material uh, in the law. So all suppliers have to be considered. Um, a first exclusion, however, can be made um, uh, based on activity. So only the suppliers uh, with recent uh, or planned activity should be included uh, in the risk analysis. Um, and of course, also data duplicates um, can be excluded, uh, which of course sounds easy, but in practice is then one of the things that are really um, yeah, uh, uh, on the to-do list at, at this step is really getting uh, to a clean supplier list uh, and excluding non-active uh, suppliers. And then those um, suppliers are then subjected to a uh, first uh, risk uh, evaluation based on country risk and uh, commodity risk. And here I would like to hand over again to Sebastian to quickly explain the approaches that can be taken uh, during this step and um, yeah, how he usually recommends this approach. Yeah, um, so um, why country risk, why commodity risk? Uh, these two uh, criteria are also mentioned in the Supply Chain Act as uh, potential options um, to, um, yeah, to, um, to understand where um, your company has certain risks. Um, so the, uh, what is meant by country risk? So country risk would mean you look at where is your um, supplier located, and um, then you have to rank all the countries your suppliers are located in according to publicly available indices um, on whether these countries are risk countries or not. Of course, these indices should reflect the risks mentioned in the supply chain law. So if you take a, um, uh, index um, on um, corruption, for example. Corruption is basically not um, covered 
um, uh, the expression itself, corruption is not covered by the Supply Chain Act. So it makes sense, of course, that you take indices that uh, reflect the human rights risks like child labor, forced labor mentioned in the Supply Chain Act. And then you would rank your suppliers according uh, to the uh, ranking of the different uh, countries they are located in. The commodity risk, um, of course, is more complex because it requires a knowledge of your uh, of the products or services in your sector. Um, depending on the sector, commodity risks could um, look very differently. Um, but that would be um, a second um, um, approach how you could um, take a look at where you have risk and where not. Um, just to mention it right now, um, after the webinar, we will provide you with a um, a guide um, 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 on um, risk analysis that um, also contains helpful indices, helpful links um, um, on um, uh, sources um, where you can find more information about country risks and commodity risks. Yeah, and and uh, we have taken this 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 blueprint from Sebastian also as an input at Prewave. So this. This step of country commodity industry risk evaluation is a step that within the pre-of system happens automatically. So we have considered for the country risk, uh, the indices uh, on country risk that are relevant to the law. And we also um, do commodity and industry classifications um, uh, for suppliers. And we have our own models um, uh, where we model commodity and industry risk based on historical data. Happy to elaborate on this uh, further in the Q&A session if, if, if it's relevant. And um, just just to, to, to mention, uh, um, because uh, Harald, you just mentioned uh, the difference between production, non-production material. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, this is uh, really interesting because, again, the law is not 100% clear. Uh, but um, here we have, um, again, a statement of the authorities. I always say statement of the authorities. All these statements, it's basically one statement. It's an FAQ you can find online um, 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 that uh, is provided by the authorities with first hints, with first explanations um, on the um, Supply Chain Act. Maybe when you continue, Harald, I can just um, uh, send the link in the... Um, in the chat, so then uh, it's it's only provided in German, uh, just to to mention it. Um, but there in this FAQ, um, the authorities say that also non-production uh, material, or they um, they call it indirect procurement, also have to be um, taken into consideration if it's relevant to ensure the existence of the company. So now they come up with a new expression. Uh, that uh, makes it maybe uh, more complicated. I don't know, but uh, it basically says also the parts you are purchasing that do not become a part of your product you're selling to your customer or the service you're providing to your customer still has uh, have to be um, considered when you um, perform your risk analysis. Um, they can be um, analyzed um, with less effort. So that's something the uh, the uh, authorities suggest, but still they have to be covered. So what means um, ex uh, um, 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 uh, purchases um, relevant for the existence of the company? Um, that's basically a lot, and also the majority basically of um, your um, purchases, because uh, your IT infrastructure, for example, your office furniture, all this is required for you to provide your services to sell your products. Maybe some um, um, some um, uh, some things can be filtered out. For example, if you have services for for your gardens uh, um, um, at your headquarters, then that's not important uh, that you maintain your uh, uh, your gardens. Uh, uh, that would be a supplier that is not uh, that does not have to be um, um, yeah uh, included in your risk analysis. But I think that in the end, it's just a minority of um, suppliers that can be filtered out with this argument. Mm. Maybe. Uh, maybe one last uh, question, Sebastian, uh, before you share the, the link to the FAQ. Um, yeah. Uh, again, around this selection of which suppliers to consider, um, a question we regularly encounter is, 
uh, but can I ignore suppliers below a certain spend level? Uh, suppliers where I have maybe just a few thousands of euros of spend per year, is that a supplier I still must include or that I can maybe not include in the risk analysis? We, we would not recommend to use this as a single uh, criteria uh, for the risk analysis because uh, um, the law basically says you have to consider the risks for the affected people and not the risks for your company. And if you only look at suppliers with a um, uh, with a minimum spend above a minimum spend level, then there could be risks for affected people also at the suppliers below uh, this spend level. And um, so you you have to make sure that um, the suppliers below this level do not completely fall out of the system. Uh, and you only focuses on focus on what is important for your companies. So what we have seen at some clients is that they combine this approach that they uh, basically, as a first step, look at the um, look at the uh, risks for the suppliers, and then they somehow consider the spend level um, because they um, uh, they consider. Um, the higher spend uh, or the highest spend uh, suppliers as the ones they have a lot of influence on. So at a at a certain point you can um, you can um, take this into consideration, but uh, you have to be careful to sort these suppliers uh, out um, right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So at the end of this exercise here, uh, we have selected and are able to proceed with the substantial suppliers where we have based on activity, um, based on their relevance for the execution of the business, as Sebastian just said, um, based on the country and commodity risk, we have identified risk potential. So those are the substantial suppliers. We are now proceeding uh, to the next step. And uh, this step is now where we really come to the, uh, let's say core of the risk analysis, because there we apply uh, the three criteria that the law gives on conducting the risk analysis. Um, that is, uh, on the one hand, the severity and probability of violations at the given supplier, um, the potential for uh, incidents to occur, uh, also uh, in, in other words, and then two other uh, uh, factors that should be considered, the degree of influence uh, you have over the supplier, and the causal contribution you have towards the violations and problems at the supplier. And um, right now we want to basically go in depth on each of those three points and uh, provide uh, tips and, and tools in order to evaluate uh, those three criteria as part of the uh, risk analysis. The first uh, step Oh, sorry, Sebastian, uh, this is still uh, now. No, 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 no problem. Matrix. <laughs> uh, first, let's say the uh, combination of those uh, <clears throat> uh, points uh, to arrive at the prioritization of suppliers. Uh, please go ahead, Sebastian. <clears throat> okay, what, what can you see here? So uh, basically, uh, the law says that you have to prioritize the risks you identified. And the um, Supply Chain Act mentions certain criteria on how to prioritize these risks. Of course, they are more, more or less simple to comprehend. Uh, uh, and um, uh, however, um, with these criteria, companies then shall decide um, if and where to take um, measures first, and also um, to decide even if certain risks are completely negligible. So what do we have here? Maybe let's start with the easiest one in the middle, degree of influence. Degree of influence, for example, would, uh, uh, yeah, most importantly be what's the ratio, ratio of your order vo volume uh, of your company compared to the turnover of the supplier. Is there any um, economic dependence? Because of course, if you, are the most important um, customer of the supplier, for example, making 80% of the turnover of the supplier, then you have mass, much more possibilities to put pressure on the suppliers than when you are only one of 10,000 customers. This is uh, one criteria to see, okay, 
is this a, a risk that we should prioritize on, that we should um, take remedial or uh, preventive measures or not? Um, the other one, uh, Harald already mentioned, severity probability of uh, violations, uh, severity, uh, for example, how many people are affected, the degree of effective, uh, effectiveness of people, the likelihood then, uh, probability likelihood of risks, risks turning into violations. This would be uh, the factors uh, that need to be considered under uh, severity probability of violations. And then we have causal. Uh, a contribution. So uh, there you would need to assess whether your company has directly caused a risk or jointly with a third party, or uh, whether your company has indirectly contributed to the risk. Um, and if it's the case that you put pressure on the um, supplier in, any, in, in certain ways, this may increase the risk. So for example, um, one thing you could focus on under cost of contribution would be your contract drafting. Um, what does this mean, contract drafting? Uh, for example, if you identified a um, certain risk supplier, a certain risk supply chain, uh, for example, raw material you are buying and you know this raw material uh, goes back into or your direct supplier sits in a country where uh, this raw material, uh, raw material um, 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 is gained under really uh, poor human rights conditions. Uh, and you look at your contracts and you see, okay, you have extremely low prices with uh, very short delivery days, uh, still very high volumes to be, live, to be delivered. Uh, in your own favor, you have long payment terms, although you know that your supplier has much shorter payment terms towards its own supplier. So that uh, it, uh, your supplier will get problems with uh, liquidity. So um, these factors all combined could be considered as a, a cause of contribution that um, in the end uh, um, increases the risks at a supplier level. Then you have to uh, somehow um, put all these criteria mentioned in the law together and then decide, okay, which are the suppliers that are critical to us, less critical, um, and um, where you want to or need to um, take uh, measures first or where you have to take um, measures only in individual cases or maybe also where you don't have to take or you don't want to take any measures at all. So there could be the situation that you have a certain, you identified a certain risk, but you say, well, this risk is completely out of our range. We are not contributing to it. We don't have any, um, leverage on that we, can, we, we basically cannot do anything. Uh, so the law um, by uh, saying you have to perform an appropriate um, uh, risk analysis, that's the expression used in the law, um, provides the option that you um, don't need to take um, measures on every risk you identified. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think now um, uh, we want to go in depth on each of those three criteria and, and give you tools on how to evaluate those criteria in an efficient uh, manner. Um, because and that's, of course, still something to keep in mind, whichever approach you take should be applicable to all of the suppliers within the risk analysis. Um, and only the measures are then uh, taken in a targeted uh, manner, only, for instance, for critical or uh, high priority suppliers. So looking at the first criteria, uh, the severity and probability of violations, um, maybe also to quickly give the, the definition of how it's written in the law. Um, so here we are talking about the severity of the violation that can typically be expected but also the reversibility of the violation and the probability of the occurrence of a violation of human rights related or an environment related obligation. So all of those things combined. And um, the best practice that we at Prewave have implemented is to take a combined 360 degree scoring approach on each supplier where you look at a combination of risk factors that you have at your disposal um, 
a core ingredient of that is an historical view on the risk incidents that have occurred at the given supplier based on what can be identified on public data. So this is, uh, let's say, a core uh, pre-wave capability of being able to look back five to 10 years into the past and identify as part of a red flag screening, which covers all of those aspects uh, of the law, um, human rights and environmental risks, um, in order to identify, have there been in the past uh, and what has been the occurrence of um, such risks at the given supplier. But that is, of course, not all that can be or should be considered uh, as part of the, the scoring and, and the risk analysis around this severity and probability of violations. Um, we also consider the country and commodity risks that we already covered, um, because we can have the situation that we have a supplier in a high-risk industry producing a high-risk commodity in also a high-risk country. So let's say a, a Chinese supplier of, of certain chemical uh, chemicals or chemical materials. But in terms of the picture on the media side, he has a, a clean slate. There's uh, no violations or problems to be found. Still, we would not rank the supplier with 100 of 100 points, but rather we want to consider the country and commodity risk as well. Now, these two uh, options here, they can be considered uh, completely automatically, and they already give a very clear indication of the risk distribution um, and the severity and probability of violations across the suppliers. In the 360 degree scoring model, they can be then optionally also um, added to uh, by supplier self-assessments that are available. Um, in many cases, um, companies have already been um, asking their suppliers uh, with self-assessments around certain certifications, uh, around also the willingness uh, to either accept the code of conduct of the given company or to have a code of conduct on their own and so on. And also uh, to consider uh, customer internal data, meaning um, data that arises, for instance, out of the uh, complaint, uh, the grievance mechanism, um, or findings of previous audits uh, or out of um, other possibly desk audits or due diligence processes uh, with the supplier. And combining that uh, in a 360 degree scoring approach, um, as we do with Prewave, um, that gives you a very complete picture on the severity and probability of violations. And the first two of those uh, quarters can be done completely automatically and uh, already bring you uh, along the, the risk analysis. The next point to cover then is the degree of influence. Um, Sebastian already alluded to the implementation best practice, which can be summed up as the share of sales. And that is basically calculated as the annual spend you have with the given supplier divided by the annual turnover or uh, sales of the supplier. And that already gives you uh, a classification. That classification, of course, is different from industry to industry, from customer to customer. In certain industries, a share of sales of 2% of, of is already high. In other industries, that's low. So that, of course, is a, a configuration to make. Um, uh, and of course, it can also be overwritten in those instances, instances where this formula gives a, for instance, medium influence, but for other circumstances that are known, for instance, certain relationships, contractual relationships, uh, even legal relationships, the influence is still high. Uh, and that can then, of course, uh, or should be considered in the model as an ability to override the share of sales uh, based approach in certain circumstances. And then uh, <clears throat> uh, the third point, causal contribution. Uh, causal contribution, as uh, Sebastian said, I think is the hardest point to evaluate in a fully automated basis um, because it is, a, at the end of the day, a, a qualitative estimation uh, to be made. It cannot be done based on, on, on quantitative, uh, let's say, data points. So in order to be efficient in the approach, um, let's say uh, 
the suggestion is to have it as a case by case determination, but to not do it for all suppliers, but again in a risk based manner. So uh, taking an approach, for instance, considering those suppliers that based on the country risk and severity and probability of violations have already been identified uh, with a certain increased level to then also um, do a um, sanity check around causal contribution, uh, whether it exists. And uh, of course, causal contribution is also something that uh, must be evaluated whenever individual risks or violations surface as an ongoing relationship with the supplier. Yeah, so is an instance, for instance, of uh, an environmental issue at the supplier possibly caused by my, the customer's, um, let's say, relationship with that supplier? Um, Sebastian, do you want to add anything to, to causal contribution? I think that's also always a very- I um, think I said it important. before, so I think we're, that's, that's fine. Yep. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so um, at the end of the day, then, um, uh, what we at Prewave have done um, with, with good guidance, um, also from, let's say, the uh, document of Sebastian that you will uh, receive later, is to now integrate those processes and, and those steps into a uh, software and, and automated approach. Um, at Prewave, this sort of... Um, sort of culminates in the uh, risk analysis dashboard, which is a dedicated section of the tool, which combines all of those aspects we just saw, the uh, 360 degree risk score uh, as a measure of the severity and probability, but also the degree of influence and causal contribution here on the uh, y-axis of the uh, risk matrix in order to arrive at a classification of the suppliers that combines those uh, three components. And what you're left with then at the end of the day is a classification, which basically um, shows you the priority to take measures. Yeah? So suppliers where you have then both a high risk score and or high degree of influence or causal contribution should be the ones where you immediately or with high priority take appropriate measures. Whereas the ones that are, let's say more in the medium a priority or low priority section uh, can be, uh, let's say, approached with less priority. And that is, let's say, the, the risk-based funnel approach uh, in a nutshell. And uh, that is the approach that we are now realizing with, with many of our customers at this point. So, yeah, um, uh, thank you very much. I think we've reached the end of our formal presentation, but of course now the fun part begins, uh, the question and answers. And, uh, we look forward to answering all of your questions. Um, please share them in the Q&A section of Zoom. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thanks a lot, Sebastian and Harald. This was really interesting. And uh, we already received eight questions. And uh, I think we can directly jump into them. Um, I think when we start from the end, uh, let's do it. Uh, we can put together the last and the uh, question before the last one. So um, how is the country aligned to a risk country if the direct supplier is located in a non-risk country, however definitely sourced and supplied by a risk country? And the other question is, uh, I think, very similar. Our factory is in another country, but we are direct supplier for many factories in Germany. Do we have to do risk analysis? for our suppliers? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I, I, I try to respond to this question. Um, so um, from my perspective, if you have a supplier that is located, so your contractual partner is located in a, um, in a certain country and this country is not classified as a high risk country, but in a low risk country, um, it, would be enough in a uh, risk analysis to um, to to re rely on this information. Um, this could be different if you have uh, information on a lot of your suppliers that um, although your contractual partner is located in a certain country, the actual factory is in another country, and this country is um, considered a risk country. But again, I would use the expression of an appropriate risk analysis. You need to start at a certain point. 
And uh, you cannot start by asking all your uh, suppliers, which uh, at certain companies are tens of thousands of suppliers, uh, whether they are not only located in a certain country, but also um, manufacturing in this country. So um, if you start from the point, okay, where is my uh, supplier located, then um, it should be enough to evaluate the suppliers by the location where he is, um, yeah, where, where your contractual partner is actually, actually located. I think, I think one scenario um, I would like to, to add here, um, and I think Sebastian, you can maybe detail how this is precisely worded in the law, but if for instance, your direct supplier is merely a, a trader, yeah, or kind of a reseller, yeah? uh, for instance, you source certain commodities, potentially even things like conflict minerals um, from a trader that is maybe located in Switzerland, um, but clearly they are sourcing the material from Congo or from other regions, then that is actually a provision in the law where um, they should be, the, the, the second tier should be treated as the first tier. I mean, correct me, Sebastian, how it's precisely worded, but um, I think there is such a provision, yeah. Um, you're right, but that the, the, the wording is uh, on a more extreme uh, mm. case. It's if you miss, if you actually abuse this um, this um, um, yeah this approach that you um, you you just you you put a trader in the supply chain just to have a trader in the supply chain in order not to look at your uh, um, uh, suppliers that are located in a problematic country. If you do this on pur purpose, then then it's a problem. Then your indirect suppliers would be considered direct suppliers. But uh, it's it's a good example that you uh, that you um, what you just said because I think it in the end it also depends on the knowledge of the company. So if you have one, two, three suppliers where you know the, they are actually uh, sourcing from a, um, a high risk country, and then you are uh, even in a, a problematic supply chain, then you could actually uh, consider this as uh, substantial knowledge, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, so that you have to look at the indirect ones. But um, the, I think the more important point uh, is that you don't have to um, start asking all your suppliers uh, whether they are sourcing from other countries or whether they are sourcing uh, from countries where they are also located in. Mm -hmm. And maybe one last, the last point from my side on, on that one um, is this is again touching on a uh, question of the the word of the law and 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 how far you want to go yeah? and and that is I think a a yeah um, let's say a, a situation that that a lot of companies are currently dealing with yeah where am I maybe going beyond the law for certain reasons what what are such reasons for instance in practice um, we see that with any OEMs with any companies that are selling to end customers. There, they really are trying to maintain um, their reputation, um, and 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 even though they might not be in violation of the law by word of the law, and maybe even a judge rules in favor of them, the reputation damage is still done if a case out of the second tier arises, where it can be argued they they could have had or had substantial knowledge about the issue. Um, so that would be then the the car companies, the fashion brands, all of those that are really clearly publicly exposed. If you are a tier three, a tier two supplier, um, then it's, I think, more the relationship towards your customer, yeah? where, for instance, in the automotive industry, the pressure comes from the OEM. Yeah? Um, so it's then really a situation of the law in practice or how it's really implemented in practice versus the, the law, how it's formulated uh, legally. Uh, all right then let's jump to the next question and i think harald that goes into uh, your direction uh, is tra transportation included into the risk analysis at freeway uh, transportation if, if, if you mean um logistics suppliers um if, if that's how i can uh, interpret the, 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 this question um yes so uh, indeed um I think uh, logistics suppliers um, is one of that area uh, 
of, of indirect spend, which is typically a high risk uh, spend uh, due to the uh, working conditions uh, in, in, in logistics. So yes, and that is actually um, what our customers do. Yeah, we, we include then the logistic service providers as well in the risk analysis, um, uh, not just the production material supplies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then we have a question. Uh, what happens if a company through acquisitions grows to above 3,000 employees in 2023? Would they have to comply immediately after deal closure or is there a transition time? Uh, well, from, from my perspective, they are included, so they fall under the law. The, fall, the law basically says you need to have 3,000 employees in general. So you need to have in general 3,000 employees. Uh, what does in general mean? You have to, yeah, uh, the law doesn't explain it ex explicitly, uh, but um, if you uh, have an acquisition, so um, from the acquisition on, you know you will have more than 3,000. Um, and let's say the acquisition is in June, 2023. And so for six months of 2023, you have more than 3,000. I think the likelihood is really high that uh, the uh, authorities would consider you to fall under the law and that in 2024, uh, you need to um, have a um, report ready. But um, depending on when the acquisition actually takes place, I think this would also something to be to actually ask the um, um, authorities, either directly or anonymously, because uh, maybe the, we don't know yet the approach of the uh, authorities, if it's more lax or if it's really strict. So um, yeah, I, I can't give you an answer, 100% uh, answer. Uh, in general, I would say if it's clear that from the acquisition on, you will have more than 3,000, and this is a, a long period in 2023, then you uh, have to consider your company falling under the law in 2023. Okay. Um, maybe we have a look at the question from Thomas. Uh, he just um, posted. Uh, to me, it seems the law suggests to incentivize to implement a solution solution just well enough to prove that you have done enough due diligence, but not any further to avoid unpleasant findings. How do you think about this and what reasons do companies have to go beyond the minimum requirements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, maybe if I can take this first, Sebastian, I think this goes sure. again to this, this point of um, um, maybe even going out, zooming out a little bit further. Why is the law here? Yeah, um, I think the law is here because the shift in the minds of the consumers um, that have more and more awareness of wanting to buy clean products and, 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 and not supporting supply chain issues in the products they buy. Yeah? Um, 75 percent of Germans support the law um, and this is really a shift in consumer behavior. Long story short, the, the law is now here, yeah? um, but uh, the drive behind it is still what the consumer wants and the consumer awareness around it. And um, let's say there might be a legal evaluation around if the company has acted in accordance with the law, but there is also going to be a, a public evaluation and the media evaluation and the reputational evaluation, um, which for many companies is probably the, the, the more relevant thing, yeah? um, because there you have potentially more than 2% of your annual revenues at risk, yeah? uh, not just the 2%. So, that again is, is my answer is, is yes, the law is there. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a first step. Um, the EU law uh, goes much further uh, as it stands right now. But yeah, um, uh, yeah, maybe Sebastian, you have anything to, to add? <clears throat> yeah, you're right. Uh, the, the last thing you said, the, the EU law, we already have a draft. So you have to uh, keep this in mind that uh, we don't know yet when uh, it enters into force. It may take a couple of years. Um, and we don't know whether it enters into force as it is shown in the draft right now. So it may look totally different in the end, but um, uh, still you have to have this in mind 
And um, another thing I wanted to mention is that I think when you go into detail, uh, detail and when you look at all the obligations that are required by the German law, it's not, it's not nothing. So it's, uh, it, it, is, um, it is quite a lot. Of course, um, we don't know yet, and you could argue whether it actually helps um, people um, in the supply chain um, in um, countries that are related to human rights uh, violations um, or not. But still, there are um, these obligations all together. They require a lot of effort and um, a change process um, that is not um, easy to perform overnight. It will take some time. Thank you. We have two other similar questions from Stefan. Hi, Stefan, from Avatur and from, uh, and then, um, from another one. So will there also be on-site supplier audits required? And the other one is really similar. Do the preventive measures have to be implemented at all direct suppliers? Um, OK, let me start with the, with the second one. Do the preventive measures have to be implement, uh, implemented at all direct suppliers? Again, this is a question what you want to do and what you need to do. So the law basically says you only have to implement preventive measures if you have identified a risk at a supplier. Uh, but of course, in practice, um, a lot of preventive measures are rolled out at every supplier. So what are the preventative measures? It could be a code of, it can be, for example, a supplier code of conduct, a supplier selection process, uh, so that you, um, in your uh, process where you select the suppliers, you um, consider human rights aspects that are taken into account that are evaluated. Uh, a um, sustainable procurement guideline, for example, KYC processes uh, with question on human rights, uh, sustainable contract design. So there, it's a lot of processes and documents you could think about. And some of these documents, for example, uh, supplier code of conduct, uh, companies typically use for all their suppliers. Um, so, um, but again, the law does not require it. Uh, it says you, you don't. You only have to take preventive measures at the um, suppliers where you um, found out a risk. So this would mean, let's stay with the example of the supplier code of conduct. You would only need to provide this supplier where you identified a risk with a supplier code of conduct, if that's your preventive measures in this uh, in this context. Um, the the other part, the other question was: Do uh, do um, audits need to take place? Uh, yes, they need to take place, but maybe not for all the companies. Not every company now needs to. Um, conduct audit at all the suppliers. Uh, you have to focus on the high risk suppliers. And maybe there are also sectors uh, where you don't need any um, to, to perform any audit at all. You know? um, and when you see the, the time during uh, COVID, uh, uh, COVID uh, audits were not possible to a large extent. So um, you have to see, we have to see how this develops. Um, in general, yes, audits are definitely a um, preventive measures that have to be uh, bear, uh, bear in mind, but um, um, with a focus. So it's it's basically always a risk-based approach and uh, also with respect to audits. Anything to add from you, Harald, on this question? No, no, okay. I think uh, very well said from Um <laughs> Then there's a question uh, from Ekaterina Harald. Uh, could you please share more information regarding the services pre-rate offers? Yes, so uh, soft, soft board question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so on the whole, we are a full-scale uh, service provider around supply chain risks. Um, and the supply chain law is one part of that. Yeah? So we are currently supporting many customers on the situation in Ukraine, but of course the supply chain law is a main focus around supply chain risks and we cover that. And our goal is, and, and was from the very beginning, and it's the same for the EU supply chain law, 
is to to support our customers from beginning to end in this process yeah so from starting off with the risk analysis uh, being able to identify uh, the, the critical suppliers with high priority to be able to then have a system where you can document the measures you take take even certain measures out of the previous system like sending su supplier self-assessments uh, asking suppliers for statements these are things you can do out of the previous system um, and then to be able to actually document and report towards the authorities so really from beginning to end and yeah that is that is the services uh, we offer and what we need from a customer is really only the supplier information you know, so name address and spend with the supplier and then we start and within um, one two or three months we have the risk analysis done and uh, we hand over the system to you and and the process goes along perfect um, and maybe you can uh, talk about uh, what kind of customers do you have because um here is another question from Waldemar. In which way is this law relevant for banks or fintechs which provide financial resources loans? Yeah, I mean, I can I can also quickly answer that. Yes, it, it is equally it, it equally applies. There's there's no differentiation on whether you're industrial uh, production uh, company or a services company. Um, of course, the nature of a service com services company is that um, the sourcing uh, is typically not as, 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 as globalized or uh, simply the, the risk patterns are, are different and, and typically less. Also, the number of suppliers is, is typically less. Um, uh, but yes, the, 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 the law applies. And um, actually, at Prewave, we have both producing companies, but also uh, services companies, even uh, banks, insurance companies uh, that are doing their risk analysis for the supply chain law uh, with Prewave. Yeah. Okay, then we have a question from Natasha. How many of these steps auditing indices for countries are already available from the market? I, I, I would say they are uh, they are all available. Yeah. Um, for instance, the country indices, indices the ones that Sebastian uh, suggests in his document that, that you will receive, they are what we can consider op open source. They are publicly available indices from, for instance, from the international labor organizations, uh, organization from from NGOs. So those are available. Um, and then, of course, uh, service providers like Prewave, uh, we are also part of the market. We offer then the, the scoring and the model and, let's say, the entire approach from beginning to end uh, for the supply chain law. Um, auditing, on-site auditing is not something we offer, but it's also something that's integrated in the approach. And there you have, of course, uh, the well-known service providers uh, on that front as well. Yeah. Okay, and uh, maybe we can pull on again the chart with the deadline. I, I think it was really great. There was a question uh, by when does the policy statement have to be submitted? Is there a deadline? Maybe Sebastian, mm -hmm. that goes uh, to your direction. Mm -hmm. um, there, there, well, the, it has to be it has to be submitted before the report is handed over to the authorities, but there is no deadline uh, within uh, the year 2023. However, of course, it makes sense that the policy statement is at the end of the process. So um, although it's mentioned in the Supply Chain Act uh, at the beginning, uh, it um, makes sense to um, have the uh, policy statement in place at, as one of the last obligations you're fulfilling. Why is that? Because the policy statement basically describes your human rights strategy how your uh, uh, who in your company not maybe not the names but in general the uh, who is who's responsible uh, which risks uh, do you consider the most important ones how have you and in the future do you want to respond to these risks with uh, certain measures how uh, uh, is your um, complaints procedure working so in order to, to describe all this um, you um, need to have fulfilled uh, or 
at least um, considered all the other um, obligations so that you can uh, put this in a policy statement that is basically really short and uh, in a nutshell describes um, uh, what you're doing in this regard. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the question from Ahmed is really similar. Um, does the law will give an exception just a space of time until find another supplier or applying the penalties directly? Um, yeah, maybe I can quickly answer that. So actually the, the law does, does not explicitly require you to, to change or to offboard and supplier, even if you listen to um, talks uh, and even the FAQs that Sebastian shares. Uh, the ministry and, and, and the agency is always quite explicit in that we do not want to force companies to immediately end relationships with a supplier. Um, that is kind of the last resort. Um, but there's a lot of measures you can take until you get to that point. Um, and and um, from, let's say, first step measures, then towards more severe measures like audits, um, trainings, uh, requiring your supplier to have certain certifications or management standards and, and so on. Yeah. Great. And there is one last question. No, <laughs> you don't <laughs> stop with the questions, but that's great. Questions are great. Uh, we are more than happy, happy to um, answer them. So let's have a look at Petra's question. It's a use case. If an import importer located in the EU with production in Asia has been affected by an environmental damage, do we need to audit the indirect vendor or can we claim from our importer to enter appropriate measures? Um, well, it depends on how the relationship between all the parties is uh, looks like. So if your uh, direct um, supplier is the EU importer and uh, uh, the uh, EU importer has another um, contractual relationship with an indirect uh, supplier and something would happen at the indirect supplier, uh, then um, of course you could, um, uh, then your, um, um, your, how can I explain? Um, so you in in in, in this in this uh, scenario, you would con uh, concentrate on the EU importer first, yeah? um, and um, well, the, let me start. Let me start differently. So I think the 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 most important thing is do you have to um, distinguish is this. Um, um, damage that uh, took place at the um, production facility of your um, direct supplier. So if it's um, just a subsidiary of the importer, then it would be your direct supplier. And then you would need to take certain measures as mentioned in the law. Um, and this is of course more that is required from you when something takes place at your direct supplier. For example, you need to develop a, a remedial action plan and you have to, um, um, for example, contact your supplier, tell him that he has to stop the violation uh, with a certain deadline, then you have, um, you, you need to um, follow a certain um, escalation plan. So that is required when you have a um, direct supplier. When all this happens at an indirect supplier and you have actual knowledge that there is a human rights violation, then we would have this um, situation of substantial knowledge and you would also need to take certain measures at this indirect supplier um, that of course um, are um, less broad because you don't have a direct relationship. So you, uh, it's not that easy for you to put so much pressure on this indirect supplier. Maybe if you are one of the most important customers of the direct supplier and um, uh, um, subsequently also for the indirect supplier, maybe then it looks differently. But then you would need to um, ask your direct supplier for help and to um, ask uh, him whether he can take certain measures to end the um, 
the violation at the indirect suppliers. But it's more limited, of course. So I think in this, uh, the question you have to distinguish uh, where does the violation happen, direct supplier, indirect supplier. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sebastian. Now we have a special one uh, and maybe we can also, so the question is, is will it be included in uh, IATF 16949? Uh, Sebastian, hopefully you know what he's talking about. Audit requirements are only German customer requirements. Um, I think so. Uh, the IATF it's uh, it's um, uh, it's uh, about quality management, and quality management uh, is um, typically something else than what the law is talking about, uh, because um, it has a different approach. Um, of course, if you have quality management uh, procedures, you could um, include human rights procedures. For example, if you perform audits with respect to quality management at your direct suppliers, then you could include um, um, certain questions um, or a certain scope on um, human, uh, human rights risks so that you also um, consider these aspects in your audit. But I think it's not included um, in quality requirements. Um, and I think it will not be included in the future. It's something, yeah, it's something beside quality management. Okay. Are there any other open questions from your side? I think we already uh, answered 18 questions. That's a lot. But are there any other questions? Of course, you can also reach out to us afterwards via mail. I will uh, share the presentation. We will share uh, the email addresses and everything you will need. It doesn't seem that there are more questions. I think then we can, we can wrap it up. Cool. Thanks a lot for the great <laughs> insights, Harald and Sebastian. Um, and of course, thanks a lot to you, our attendees, to listen in. We hope that we could give you a good overview of the upcoming Lieferkettengesetz, the German Supply Chain Act. Um, if you have more questions, just read out, reach out to one of us, like I mentioned before. And with that, take care and goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. <clears throat>